Good afternoon and welcome to this Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing Nurse Practitioner Residency Webinar. I'm Rebecca Badeau. I'm the Communications Director for the School of Nursing and I will serve somewhat as your MC this afternoon. We want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to learn more about our Advanced Nurse Practition Practitioner Residency Program at UC Davis Health. For the next hour, we hope to highlight a bit more about the residency program, why new NP graduates should apply for this program, and what makes the UC Davis Health Residency Program unique. You will hear from program leadership, a preceptor, and also two alumni of the program, so you'll really learn what to expect. We have the Q&A feature open, so if any time while you're hearing the presentation, even before we get to the Q&A section, plop your question right in there, and we will um, we'll answer it either live or there are also NP residency program staff on hand that might be um, answering some of those as well. So a, record, a recording of this will be posted tomorrow. So if you didn't get anything, you'll be able to watch it again, just you know, as you're taking notes. But we hope you'll just sit back, relax, and listen to all this wonderful information. And we will begin with Dr. Deb Bakersian. She is the director of the program. Deb, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you so much, Rebecca. <clears throat> I appreciate it, I'm here. Happy to be here to share with everyone a bit more about the UC Davis uh, residency program and what makes it unique. Here on this slide, you will see uh, advanced NP practice and uh, that stands for primary care residency in addiction, chronic care, telehealth, improvement science, collaboration and equity. And we are thrilled to have funding from the Health Services, a Health Resources and Services Administration grant, along with each one of our participating clinical partner who contribute to the salary of the residents. There are two main goals for the residency. Uh, first is supporting new NP res, uh, graduates in transition to practice through mentored structured clinical experiences. And then secondly, expanding medical capacity and improving health outcomes in rural and medically underserved communities. We are currently recruiting for our fifth cohort of NP residents. I can't hardly believe that. The time has gone by so, so quickly. We um, started out uh, with our residency with family nurse practitioners and adult, adult gero primary care nurse practitioners. Um, that's what we had in our first um, several cohorts. We added a psych mental health NP into cohort number four. And now we want to be adding women's health, gender related NPs and primary care uh, pediatric NP uh, in cohort five. So we hope some of you who are out there listening um, are some of those uh, types of NP students as well. Last year, we successfully passed accreditation, earning a three-year accreditation from the Consortium for Advanced Practice Providers. It's the highest accreditation possible on an initial accreditation. Um, the accreditation validates our program structure, curriculum, and processes, and attests to that it is a rigorous program that meets high quality standards. So Deb, first of all, I have to say congratulations for the accreditation because I know that was an incredible team um, and collaborative effort both here in the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing and also across uh, the campus at UC Davis Health and the Medical Center. Um, so other than the accreditation and a very clever acronym, can you please talk a little bit about what makes this residency program unique? Yes, I, I'm delighted to do that, Rebecca. I, I want to say one of the things that makes it unique is really the people that participate in it. Um, and I, I mean that not only our, our faculty and our staff, but also the residents um, that, uh, that come into the program. We try very hard to engage with the residents to include them as part of the program. We ask what they want out of the program. We get input on the curriculum and try to adapt to the unique needs of each of the cohorts. This program, I will say, is an accelerated program where we facilitate growth in the residents from novice advanced beginners 
to competent and proficient clinicians by the ed end of this uh, uh, residency. And we also expand well beyond the clinical focus to include leadership, practice management, risk management, quality improvement, and patient safety issues such as diagnostic errors to help the residents understand the entire role of being an advanced practice provider. We also include the residents in our own internal QI processes. I'm sure our residents today will share with you that they've had many suggestions for how to improve the program. And we really try to integrate those suggestions of impro for improvement along the way. This past year, we started integrating opportunities for the NP residents to interact with the APP fellowship across um, in the hospital. And we hope to expand on that even further this next year. We have also created a partnership with the VA to integrate their NP residents as well. So it's been a really, really exciting past uh, 12 months with the accreditation and the partnerships that we've um, developed. I believe we have a slide that talks a little bit more about those clinical placements and our partnerships with the FQHCs. Deb, for folks who don't know the FQHC, can you expand upon that? Yes, FQHCs are federally qualified health centers these are health centers that are uh, specifically focused with the mission of providing care to underserved populations. Uh, they are supported through the federal government who have all kinds of requirements that they have to meet, but also they, um, the federal government provides some financial support uh, for the clinics to be able to provide the care to the underserved population. And you can see here that we have several sites that are FQHCs, uh, Sacramento County, One Community Health, WellSpace, Sacramento Community Clinics, Harmony Health, El Dorado Community Health Centers, and Community Medical Centers down in the Stockton area. Um, so if you look at the map, we have several of these clinics that are in the Sacramento kind of county region. And then we have uh, Yuba City up to the north, Placerville out to the east, and Stockton down south of us, all of whom have clinics that participate in, um, in our program. I think that map really helps because UC Davis Health has a huge catchment area. So this really is covering a broad um, swath of, of needs in, in the region. Um, Deb, I know we'll have questions for you in a minute, but I want to get to Dr. Laura Van Ocker who is the Associate Director of the Residency, and she really oversees that educational curriculum. Um, and I am using first names. We're going to be informal since this is a lunchtime uh, webinar. Laura, can you provide some of the background on how residents receive that clinical education and the teaching opportunities across the 12 months? Well, one of the things that's really valuable is that we, again, have had, uh, going into our fifth year of experience now, and we have a, a, a staff um, and faculty that are very um, well educated in not only support for new nurse practitioners, but are also very experienced themselves. But we always want to start by learning about the cohort that we begin with. And so we conduct a baseline uh, skills assessment and really listen to the new residents coming in where they feel their strengths are, uh, where they feel their challenges are, and we really want to look at periodically how we can impact on ways to strengthen and build confidence and skills. So these surveys that we have, um, that we provide in the beginning and then intermittently, allow us to really design a program that is not only unique to individuals, but also the cohort each year. We recognize there are certain things impacting on education, such as the pandemic that uh, necessitated us adjusting some of our um, approaches and support in certain areas based on how um, our residents were coming in. But we really are focused on the new graduate and um, coming in as an advanced uh, beginner and enhancing their skills. Since we've added the, PD, the psych mental health nurse practitioner program, we're really upping our curriculum in the area of uh, psych mental health that is really enhancing that particular uh, space for everybody in primary care. 
as we add our women's health and, and gender health and pediatric specific experiences and curriculums, uh, we again think that really uh, provides opportunity for all of our primary care providers to enhance their skills. And you can see by this slide that we really stratify um, and enhance uh, using a variety of different teaching methods. We use simulation, we use um, hands-on experiences and procedures, uh, for example, uh, enhanced suturing, uh, biopsies, um, you know, placement of uh, long-acting uh, contraceptive devices. We also take a look at some of the skills related to, say, cognitive assessment. And we stratify this over our quarters in not only uh, periodic three to four day on campus sessions, but also through our uh, twice a month asynchronous sessions where we actually spend time um, with some didactic from experts, but also some rigorous uh, discussion uh, amongst the group and sharing of cases. And then also the opportunity to have asynchronous modules so that the learning can go on at a self-paced enhancing skills. So we feel we've really curated this to a high level that will accelerate not only confidence, but uh, skills and uh, cognitive development for new nurse practitioners. So Laura, over the four years, how have you um, learned the how these various teaching modalities actually benefit the residents in the program? Well, we get feedback. Uh, we actually do what we call 360 surveys, you know, where we actually survey uh, not only the self-assessment of the resident, but also feedback from their mentor. Um, they have mentoring uh, from other uh, nurse practitioners that we uh, create a buddy program. And so that ability to have recurrent and constant feedback in a 360 really allows us to customize it to the individual and also to the cohort as a whole. We have some nurses that come in experts in certain areas, and that enhances the cohort skill um, in addition to uh, the types of things that we provide as well. None of the residents I've spoken with has ever said they get bored. So that's good that you're mixing up. Thank you, Laura, for that perspective. I want to bring in Holly Kirkland Kine. She's an assistant clinical professor. She's also the associate director of our new nurse led mobile clinic, which is a new initiative here at the School of Nursing. She'll talk to you a little bit. Um, she was also a longtime director of the wound care at UC Davis Health, um, where she served as a preceptor for NP residents and completed those wound care specialty rotations that we've been talking about. Um, so Dr. Kirkland Klein, can you explain the role of a preceptor for these NP residents? Yes, the preceptor really is there to help um, guide your practice and question you to encourage you to question you know, your decisions and how you'd like to make those decisions, finding resources and help you make connections to those resources. So uh, let's say in the wound care um, realm, we're creating some, some uh, advanced wound care uh, modules for you to do. And along with uh, other education, and we want to set you up within uh, one of the clinics. We have a couple of clinics at the hospital and also in the community that we can send you to. And I'd like you each to get the experience to have at least two days in the clinic. And with all those experiences and you get enough continuing education units within the wound modules, you're then going to be set to be able to uh, challenge the certified wound specialty exam. And that's really valuable. Even if you never do the exam, the information is so valuable as an NP because oftentimes it's it's not a specialty people think is, is needed, but at the same time, you have to be able to diagnose these things and make sure you have the right diagnosis um, as you're treating and make sure that you document everything appropriately, you know, prevent yourself from getting into litigation and other issues. So I look forward to working with all of you. Um, Again, we have, I think that it is the first advanced practice wound program um, in the country, and um, we hope to make it really enjoyable for everyone. So I have to ask, obviously, wound care is one component of the larger curriculum, which is quite rigorous, as we could tell from that slide. What are your expectations in wound care from these residents during their 12 months? Uh, you know, I'd like them to share with each other and to share with me maybe photos. We can talk about things. I'm hoping that they'll all get a chance to come out on um, 
to the river where we see patients uh, and and we did a lot we got a lot of wounds out there in a low resource setting so um again uh, the expectation is that you would be engaged and that you would keep your mind open to what the possibilities are if you if you can't follow the rules the way you learned in the hospital perhaps because again in a low resource setting we got to get pretty you know creative about how we solve problems with with patients and what their goals are from a personal perspective, what's your favorite part of being a preceptor? Um, just the relationships and getting to know people. I, I usually spend the first day saying, tell me where you came from. Tell me what's going on with you. What's your interest? Where do you see yourself like moving within this? Because sometimes people will come in and go, you know, I am really interested in spinal cord injuries. A friend of mine fell off of a mountain and developed a spinal cord injury. And I'd really like to make sure that I work with that population for wounds. And so um, again, if you came out of neonates, whatever your area is, there's a wound. I had a wound that we can talk about. So um, again, and we're, we're creating hopefully a, a website we have, it's available now to the the hospital, we want to make sure that we can have those about 45 different short modules on wound care and, you know, maggot therapy and all those really sexy things. <laughs> yes, only a wound care specialist could find <laughs> but I do appreciate that perspective. Thank okay. you. So I know so many who are joining us want to know, what is it like being a resident? So we've got some folks who are fresh out of the program um, that can share that with you. First, we have Miriam Lakes. She completed the program in September of 2022. So she's been out a little over a year after that. Her assigned primary care clinic was Community Medical Centers. That was an FQHC in Stockton. And she continued to, to practice there post-residency. Um, I'm going to take you back to that map. Stockton was that southernmost point of the map. Um, she earned a Master of Science Family Nurse Practitioner degree from the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing before that. Um, and she had also worked as a registered nurse in the Med Surge unit caring for an incarcerated population. All right, Miriam, there's your resume. Um, but, you know, I want to ask you, you've seen other advanced providers hired at community medical centers within the past year who didn't have the benefit of this residency like you did. How do you think your transition to becoming an independent provider was different having experienced this 12-month residency? Um, hi, nice to meet you all. My name is Miriam, like Rebecca said. Um, I will say that I've become sort of the default um, like welcoming NP at my clinic. Uh, because I know how rough it can be to to start as um, as a new provider. Um, I would say that the residency gave me the chance to really um, slowly build up a panel of patients and take my time at the beginning. And that's definitely not something that new providers have, um, especially in the FQHC setting. So that's been um, that's been a huge that was just a huge it was very valuable for me to be able to slowly ramp up and um, figure out where I could become more efficient, where I didn't need to be as efficient, that kind of thing. So um, I've watched a lot of new providers struggle with that kind of thing and had to kind of give them pep talks. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm still I'm still at my clinic. Well, it's interesting because obviously the 12 months gives you those hard skills, a lot of that knowledge. Holly was just talking about the wound care preparation, but some of those I might call them a soft skill, the intangibles of the confidence building. How much confidence did you achieve over those 12 months? And how did that play into you not feeling so overwhelmed as maybe another incoming uh, new NP might have felt? Well, I think um, confidence kind of comes with within from within, too. So it's something that we have to learn. We have to learn, um, learn how to grow ourselves, I guess. I will say that um, as you slowly build up the patients that you're seeing every day, so you start seeing, you know, four every half day. And by the end, I think I was seeing around um, like 18 to 20 a day total. Um, so when you're doing that, it, it, it still feels as hard at the end as it did at the beginning. But then you look back, but you're looking and it becomes a little more about time management and a little less about becoming as anxious about the the skills and the medicine itself. So it's it's um figuring out how to kind of check in with yourself, I guess. And the residency gave me some of those skills as well. 
So what advice would you give a newly graduated NP um, who is, you know, regarding maybe a residence opportunity to make the most of that experience? Um, I would say it's definitely worth doing a residency, but um, I, I think it's also important to know what kind of support you are going to have at, at your site. Um, my site was a, was difficult and it continues to be a hard place to practice. Um, there's not a whole lot of support. So just um, really figuring out what kind of support you can get from the program, from your residency program, and also what kind of support you can get just as a new provider in general at your site and figuring out who can be a mentor, who can be an ally, that kind of thing um, is, the, is the advice I would give any new to practice provider. Good advice. Okay, thank you for that. I wanna bring in Sandra Kamba, who is our other very recent graduate. She was in the most recent cohort of the residency. Sandra earned a Master of Science Family Nurse Practitioner degree from you guessed it, the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. <laughs> and before that, she worked as a registered registered nurse for seven years in an adult and pediatric general medical surgical unit. Now, after completing the program, Sandra began serving in a faculty role, mentoring and helping uh, Dr. Bakersian and Kirkland Kine in the nurse-led mobile clinic. We're going to hear a little bit more about that because I keep teasing that, um, really mm -hmm. to lead the development of educational materials for learners in the clinic. So Sandra, I got to ask you, why did you opt to do a residency program in the first place? Oh, well, hello, everyone. Um, so there are several reasons for me why the residency route worked for me. Uh, first of all, because our program, we entirely did it during the COVID uh, era. So there were limitations sometimes on um, opportunities to serve the type of uh, clientele or patient population that I wanted to serve. I, I, during my um, time at UC Davis as a student, I didn't really get to work with um, patients from um, underserved communities a lot. And so I, uh, the residency gave me opportunities to do that. So I it, it seemed like a really good segue for me into practice, one. And two, I, am, I have a background in education as well, and I really wanted to combine those skills, my um, provider skills, as well as education. And I knew that with the residency, there were opportunities to, to, to uh, do that a little bit so I can see what that actually would look like for me to combine nursing and education as well. And I I think also the, you you um you talked about confidence, Rebecca. And then for me, for me, that was actually a huge issue. It's a huge thing as well that I figured with the residency, I can sort of gain confidence into independent practice, having mentors working with me side by side as I transition into independent practice. So that 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 was another reason why I I chose to go the residency route. So in complete transparency, I will say yes, we are biased to our program because it's our program, and there are many others out there. Sandra, why did you choose this one? So um, because I graduated from UC Davis, of course I had um a mirror into the culture of the School of Nursing. And what resonated the most for me as a student of color, um, I felt that UC Davis did not only talk about diversity, but it lived it. Because uh, in my years as a student, there were so many things that we brought up to faculty in terms of uh, ways that we could improve gender gender medic medication medicine ways that we could improve um um what do you call it ways that we talk about or how we approach treating patients of color and i felt that the faculty really listened to us and and incorporated some of the things that we came up with students and even um invited us to actually be on the curriculum uh, panel to for the DNP program. So I felt that not only is 
not only does the program care about the patients, or diverse person, patients, but it also really cared about students and, and students of color. We come in with different experiences and I felt that that was respected a lot. So I wanted to be part of that program. So that resonated a lot with me. And those different perspectives are valued. I mean, that 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 is a value promise we make. And I'm glad to hear you know that, that we live up to it. It's, yes. it's interesting because um, you talk about that cultural humility aspect of, of providing mm -hmm. care. How now are you taking what you learned in the residency program and that educational um, background that you have to now serve in this mobile clinic effort, which our mobile clinic is, is a new mobile, it's a nurse led mobile clinic, there is a van um, that really goes out to work with refugee and unhoused populations. So how are you um, combining all the skills that you have to date? I think the most thing that I got from all of these experiences for me is how to, how to humanize other folks and how to listen to their stories so people feel heard. So that way you can create these meaningful relationships with folks and empower them uh, as, they, as they actually take part in their own, in their own health healthcare. Because um, when I worked as a resident, I worked with uh, Afghani population that I'd never worked with before. So there was a lot of learning on my end. So um, when you look at the power structure between provider and patient, so try to approach that with so much humility that I'm here to listen to your story and you tell me how to be with you. So it really helped me and it humbled me a lot to actually see that, no, I can learn a lot from people who are coming to me for services, that we can have this partnership that's very meaningful. And I have transferred that to the population that we are working with now, because I have I, I had very limited experience with uh, unhoused population. So I'm learning a lot and how how to how to form that partnership with them, how to to have trust from from folks that we're we're serving so that way it we can break down those barriers to care with them. So it's it's a lot of and and as well if I'm coming in with education, what kind of education can I what does that material look like so that way it's received well in a meaningful way for for to to actually fulfill the objective that we're trying to uh, get to. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot of learning and constant learning as well. So I'm, I'm glad to have those opportunities to grow. Leading with curiosity. I always say that that is the best approach. Um, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Sandra and Miriam. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, let's get to, on to some of the nuts and bolts. Um, Deb, can you join some more? Um, give us the details as far as actually applying to the program. Sure, happy to do so. So um, you're going to be seeing this slide that um, that tells you more or less what to do. Um, it really starts with this application process, which opens on December 8th. So it's coming up very uh, opened on December. Is that right? The, the 8th? Um, so anyway, the process is outlined on our website, but I wanted to speak to a couple of the things that you see there. You see a CV, so it could be a curriculum vitae or a resume that you develop. When you look at your CV or your resume, resume, please be sure it is really complete in terms of all your experiences. Um, for example, uh, you're going to put in there not only the work experiences and your education uh, background in there, but also your clinical rotations that you completed in, in your NP program. Also include things like teaching, whether or not you have participated in quality improvement projects. What kind of committee participation did you part uh, were you engaged in? Uh, scholarship, such as have you presented a poster or have you written or um, participated in writing a manuscript? Your personal statement should support why you were a good candidate for this residency and why you want to come here to UC Davis. 
And then the DEI statement should speak specifically to how you have contributed to DEI. So it's not just knowing about it, but what have you contributed to it? Now, you're all learners. And so it might be that uh, your contribution is taking courses, uh, taking a course in that, participating in a committee, uh, learning about it at a conference, uh, reading about it. And so that you can start to integrate issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion into your role as an advanced practice provider. Applications are due January 31st. And then a, a, subset, a subset of those applicants will be invited to interview between March 11th and 15th. This should say 2024, not 2023. And then we'll be having a, an optional uh, Q&A uh, session on March 5th. So mark your calendar for that. And that will be for people to ask additional questions that they might have uh, prior to that uh, interview process. So obviously the application is a hefty lift, but it doesn't stop there. What comes next after <laughs> you the application? <laughs> That's right. Um, so when you look at this slide, this really goes along with the hiring um, requirements. All of the NP residents are employed by UC Davis Health for 12 months. And so as part of that employment, you also have to um, meet the criteria here. Uh, and some of this um, has to do with limitations that we have from our HRSA grant. So for example, you must have completed your nurse practitioner program from an accredited uh, NP program between April 1st, 2023 and June 15th, 2024. Um, that is a HRSA requirement. We don't have any leeway over making changes in those dates. You must pass your national board certification exam, which can be from either AANP or ANCC. And then you need to obtain all of the um, appropriate licensure that will allow you to practice here in the state of California. So for those of you who may be coming from outside the state, uh, you need to understand this takes many weeks to get, um, get through the licensure process on, on the California side of the, the house. It's, they're, not, they're not quick, unfortunately. We wish we could move them along more quickly, but we haven't been able to. Um, also, just so that you know, uh, if your program did not include an advanced pharmacology course within the program, you have to submit, you have to take such a course and you have to submit an advanced pharmacology course verification form. It's a, available through the Board of Registered Nursing. This is so that you can get the NP furnishing number and a DEA. Um, also, other requirements, uh, you, you have to um, have a BLS, a current and valid BL, a BLS. You need your uh, national provider identification number. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, your DEA license as well. So that those are all required for part of credentialing. Okay. So we've already got questions coming in about these basics of the application. Uh, sure. Let's jump right to them. The first one is about references. Deb, can you tell us how references are handled? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the thing about references is that we're, uh, if, you, if you make it sort of the second stage, uh, we're asking for the references later. Um, we know that references are some of the most difficult things to get. So we want to not have people jump through hoops to get references if they don't really get into the program. So references best are best if they come from someone who knows your expertise and can attest to your expertise in the role of a nurse practitioner, an advanced practice provider. So this might be faculty that you worked with who know you well and know your clinical skills. Um, it might be a preceptor that you have worked with um, preceptors often make really, really good references. So you want to make sure that they can speak to your skill set as an, a nurse practitioner, not to you as a person. Please do not have your friend or your colleague who's uh, um, uh, at the same level as you are 
uh, uh, send, uh, send a reference letter. We really want it from supervisors, preceptors, uh, educators. But my mom always has such glowing things to say about me, Deb. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was eager to jump to the questions. I, I failed to mention there are some very important special reminders on the screen. Let's go over these because these are critical um, uh, points in time in the process. Yes. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, everybody needs to know that this is a full-time program. Uh, it's a Monday through Friday. Uh, it's eight plus hours a day because uh, almost any clinical environment, even though they say you're working from eight till five, nobody gets on t out on time and, and neither do the residents. There's four days a week of clinic and one day a week per ed uh, of education per week. Um, that's on a Wednesday. So four days of clinic, you're definitely going to put in a very full day on those days. The clinic days um, usually are a half day of education and a half day of sort of catching up. And often this is a uh, time that you can use for either any special education you want to do, reading that you want to catch up on, uh, uh, any of the wound care modules that you're working on, that sort of thing. And also sometimes the, the residents will use that time to catch up on their in-basket. There are quarterly in-person education sessions. Uh, Laura mentioned that earlier. These are either three or four days, consecutive days, where we bring you back to the campus. Um, they are uh, usually intensely clinical skills oriented, uh, so hands-on kinds of learning uh, during those time periods. Also, I need to tell you, you cannot be employed elsewhere under your clinical license during the 12-month residency. That means you cannot work as a registered nurse somewhere else. You cannot work as a nurse practitioner somewhere else. Now, you could do some other kind of work uh, if you want to, you know, make some money on the outside working at Starbucks or doing something like that. You, you can, but it, you can't work under your license, under your clinical license outside. Your, again, your NP National Board exams uh, tells you the dates here. You, you absolutely must meet these dates for, for the uh, national board exam so that um, we can make sure that we can get uh, the applicants who, who are successful uh, into the program so that we can get your credentialing all completely done. Uh, that has to be done before you get started in the clinic. Okay, a lot of specifics. I will remind you, we are recording this webinar. You will get this again tomorrow for those of you joining us. Also, our website is a wealth of, of knowledge when it comes to all these uh, particular things. There it is right there. And then hs-npresidency at ucdavis.edu. Our incredible residency team is there to help you as you navigate the application and beyond process. All right, so those are the important things. Now we've got a slew of questions coming in. Let's talk about uh, a CV. Do you also want to see items from the BSN um, and items done that they've done as an RN? Yeah, I think that, that uh, that's all fair game. So for example, in your when you um, were worked as an RN, if you participated in QI and committees, I would add that into your resume. We are really looking for people who not only are clinically proficient, but have an interest in some of the other things that we're, we've talked about in, uh, in scholarship, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, in rural health, in uh, caring for underserved. So we want to know as much about you as we can. And the way that we know that is from your resume. Is there any other part of the application that makes a candidate stand out? I mean, anything that demonstrates that they'll be successful in this residency program? Yeah, there's, there's an opportunity to do a candidate statement. And in your candidate statement, you can talk a little bit about why you want to be in the residency, what you hope to gain out of it. You can talk about it, what, what you have in your background that would make you a good resident. So that's your opportunity to really talk about that. What about applicants who speak Spanish or are working towards Spanish fluency? Is there a preference for multilingual applicants? Yes, um, multilingual applicants do get a, a, a little 
uh, bump in points. We do a lot of the application based on points for certain kinds of things. We are looking for, um, actually, to be honest with you, any multilingual applicant uh, is an enhancement because what it tells us that you've worked, you understand a different culture than, than your own, you speak a different language other than English, and it might be English is your second language, that's all great. Uh, we have, obviously, this is California. We have a lot of Spanish-speaking individuals, so Spanish is very uh, valuable. But you heard earlier, um, we have a very big Afghani population. We have, we are now getting lots of uh, refugees from Ukraine and from Russia. Uh, we have also a very big Hmong uh, population. So, so all of these languages are really, really important. Um, and and so we do recognize uh, a different language capability as, as an enhancement. Okay, now we have a lifestyle question. So Sandra and Miriam, this one is coming to, to either or both of you. Have you as residents found a balance, ah, the elusive balance between the residency and family home life? Also, are most residents from the area and what kind of support do you find from each other? So I don't know who wants to take that first, but you all have lived it. So um, Miriam, you want to take it first? Sandra, how about you? You want to talk about work-life balance? With respect to work-life balance, for me, I don't know whether, I don't think it's really just about the residency. It's about, it could have been any job. I have two little kids, so it could have been any job, even my job before going into NP school, before going into the residency, I still had to figure out how to manage that with two little kids. Uh, but um, from what I was hearing from my other um cohort members as well it, during my cohort um initially with any job it takes trying to figure out okay how do i place this where how do i manage this but i think eventually we all figured out how to manage all of that and and we supported each other quite a lot we had our own um texting group and we tried to meet every at least once every month we would meet on Zoom sometimes to speak on those things. Like um, I'm not uh, t writing the notes, I think was one thing initially that was difficult for some of us, finding, finding a good balance on when to leave work at work and when to take work home. So we shared strategies with each other. And sometimes even when we had complex cases, we tried to work on that on our own and we figured out, oh, this one is the diabetes expert. When I have diabetes questions, I ask this, this, um, this particular person on that. So it, it, it was very valuable to sort of come together, work together as a group and support each other in, in all of this. That is interesting, Sandra, because I've heard from multiple cohorts that have gone through that this really is a close-knit group. Miriam, is that something you, you found as well, that you may be at different sites, but you're still a cohesive group because you're all going through this journey together? Definitely. And I mean, people, like I'm still in touch with people from my cohort as well. And um, just like Sandra said, I still have people from my cohort that I reach out to for clinical questions. So um, your peers are also your, your resources. Um, and then as far as work, work life balance, um, I think it's, it's not going to be any harder than, you know, getting through NP school was. So, um, yeah. And, and charting, I will say is what, what gets the best of you. I, I don't think anyone goes into primary care for work life balance necessarily. So, um, I think we're all, we're all still working on it. Um, it's definitely a challenging field to go into. Work in progress is okay, but I'm glad, I'm glad you at least admitted that. Um, Deb, we're having some questions about uh, compensation during the residency um, and maybe expectation for compensation post-residency. Yes, um, sure. I, I, I'm not going to be able to give the exact amount of the compensation, but I can tell you it's somewhere right. Be, and that's because it's set by academic personnel and we won't know until after. 
um, uh, probably closer to the, the spring time frame, but it's somewhere around $75,000. It's, it's probably just north of that. Um, it's also fully benefited. So there, it comes by the end of the year, you will have earned five weeks of vacation. Um, we, we allow you to take two weeks uh, during, the, during the year of that vacation time or use vacation time uh, for sick pay because we uh, faculty don't have sick pay. So um, there are ways that you can use that. And also if you don't use all of your vacation time, we, we pay it out at the end of the year. So there's that, there's also 14 holidays uh, again, many of the clinics don't have 14 holidays, so we've been talking about ways that we can uh, compensate uh, and balance that out for the residents um, who don't end up have, being able to take those days off uh, during the year. And do you have a target for how large this cohort will be? Well, we originally were at the 9 or 10, um, right around 9 or 10. However, we have put in for some additional funding, and if we get funded, it will allow us to bring in uh, three or four extra NP residents. So it could be a cohort up to 13 or 14 this year. Excellent. Laura, I want to bring you in because we have a couple of questions about how are you supporting um, the residents um, in their clinical sites when they may be challenging? So what kind of support do they get? And also, does having a lot of RN experience before coming to this residency, is that critically needed? Is it is it beneficial? Well, um, I'll start with the second one first. Our, there's no question RN experience absolutely uh, feeds into being a nurse practitioner, but it's not the only experience that we look to. Uh, we have programs that are master's entry programs um, that include the nurse practitioner, um, uh, certificate, uh, certificates as well. And we know we can get high quality candidates coming from those programs as well. So it's really uh, about the candidate, their confidence in their skills and experiences that they've had before. Uh, perhaps they've had other types of counseling experience or clinical experience that's beneficial. So the RN experience absolutely is valuable, but it's not the only experience that we look at. As far as support, that's one of the things that I think I enjoy the most. Um, as a nurse practitioner with four decades of experience, I think I've been through a lot of different types of experiences in clinical settings, and same with the other faculty that you see here too. And so sometimes it's a simple phone call. Um, I provide uh, my my uh, cell phone. Uh, I text with residents when there's really we encourage them to to dialogue with their uh, mentors and preceptors and administrators uh, as a first line. But we intervene if there's a need to clarify expectations. If we feel that um, we need to enhance their experience, then we will support them with special types of training if necessary. And the other thing is to just help in this role transition of having this new responsibility as a nurse practitioner. And that's an evolution and uh, being feeling supported, uh, but not being given all the answers is sometimes the best support that you can give, providing resources for expanding knowledge. Um, and the other thing is just being there. There is no question that when things are tough, even uh, Miriam will, will agree, um, we were talking and saying, how do we uh, get to a best outcome in this particular environment? So it varies by candidate, varies uh, by our resident, varies by the clinic. I would just like to, to add to that really quickly um, in that we, we have recognized that we've had some variability in our mentoring program in the past, and we're taking some steps to really address that by bringing another faculty person on to help with the mentoring and the site visits and things like that. So uh, again, you know, listening to the residents and what they would like to see and responding to that in a way that's supportive. Um, you know, it's, it is a lot, this transition is a lot and it's a bit of an accelerated program in addition to that. So we're, we're really, um, uh, we were just actually talking about this idea that it's a very hard transition for, for NP students to become NPs and they you know, come into the residency with a little bit of a student persona that's hard for them to get rid of. 
So it's that transition along with transitioning the clinical skills, practice management, and all of the other things. So uh, mentoring is really, really important, and we're we're really shoring up our mentoring program moving forward. Where are our residents coming from? I mean, when they come in, we you know we showed that we're at a you know Northern California geographical region, but where all um, are our residents coming from? Oh, all over the all over. So uh, we have uh, residents from all over the state of California, down all the way to San Diego, all the way up to the north, uh, in the in the um, in the Eureka area, Humboldt County. We have residents from um, other states, uh, Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, uh, so all over the United States, we we don't have any preference about where people come from. Um, it's really more, are they a good match? Do they have goals that align with the goals of this program, which is uh, really providing care to underserved? So we're happy no matter where you come from. And what about housing or relocation? Yes, we don't provide any relocation. The grant just does not have that kind of funding associated with it. Uh, and we also don't provide housing. So it would be up to each individual to find housing. We can assist in directing you where to find housing and where some of the best housing is, depending on where your clinical site, but we, uh, there is no housing support. Okay, I'm gonna to try to get in a couple more because we're almost to the top of the hour. Laura, can you speak to um, the, is there a different curriculum for the psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner? Because we have been talking a lot about the FNP, but you mentioned that that is now being woven in. How does that fit in? Well, we really curate not only to the specialty, but also to the generalist. And there's a lot of overlap in the responsibilities. There's no question that there's general um, medicine uh, involved in both types of specialties, whether that be family practice or psych mental health. And so there's a lot of curriculum that um, is an overlap. For example, diabetes managers in psych mental health, they atypical antipsychotics uh, can precipitate metabolic syndrome. And so that would be a session very appropriate for all of it, whether it uh, be PEDS, uh, we talk about through the lifespan. But also we uh, focus on certain implantables, for example, it wouldn't be appropriate so much for the psych mental health uh, nurse practitioner to go through our session on implanting uh, IUDs. And so we uh, find alternative learning um, and experts that are mentors and provide specialty curriculum in those specialty areas. But when we can bring a deeper learning to the family practice from this specialty in psych mental health, also very much a part of primary care, then we're gonna overlap and we actively review and curate every every session to really be an optimal learning experience for specialties and generalists. And I would just I would just add to that really quickly that we have a very strong um, uh, uh, collaborative uh, arrangement with the Department of Psychiatry. We have our own psycho psych mental health nurse practitioner faculty here as well. So uh, we have lots of expertise that's helping us with um, growing that that curriculum. What about the gender care aspect of the residency? You touched on that. Yeah, so we we are really, really looking for um, folks that want to do women's health. But I will tell you that we also have an NP uh, faculty member here who's the director of gender health, um, a gender, gender affirming care here at in our school of nursing, working in the health system. So it's an FNP who is in charge of that. Uh, we're thrilled to have him. Miles uh, is a fantastic partner. Uh, he does come and do some presentations at the and uh, at the for the residency. And there's um, he's developing ongoing curriculum. We're we're expanding the curriculum even in our own NP program and PA program. So I think that there will be a lot of opportunities for gender health issue, issues uh, along the way. And Deb, I would add that, you know, the fact that we are a very large research and practice oriented university provides an extraordinary depth of specialty. Our guest speakers are advanced practice providers and physician specialists at every level. And so our pool of uh, resources is phenomenal. Yeah, um, for sure. 
Okay, so any last minute advice, um, Laura, that you would like to give these folks? And, and I'll mention, we do have some very case specific questions that are very individual. I encourage you to email our residency team um, and we are also collecting these, or you may be hearing from, from one of them as well, but um, that's all the questions we'll take. So Laura, last minute uh, advice. My last advice, please come. Uh, we really look forward to quality um, applicants. Um, we we focus on accelerated skills and knowledge. Um, so I wouldn't say that we're a remedial program, but we absolutely want to support you where you come to us. Uh, so please give us a good look. Deb? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, we are looking for a lot of diversity in our in our cohort. We we really live that whole concept of having a diverse uh, population. I think that we are very collaborative. We are, we love this program and um, we'll look forward to seeing um, all of you apply. We really hope that you will. And Sandra, one last plug, having gone through it yourself, what's the best part that you would tell someone why to apply for it? Um, I think like I said to the new cohort, um, now that I've gone through the residency, I'm very comfortable with things that I don't know, which before that I couldn't have said that. And so to to continue with my practice with that attitude of um, like this room for learning and I'm okay with that. And I'm also comfortable with the things that I really know. And I have a lot of confidence in all those things that I know. So having mentorship to be in that space where you, you have that support to, to research, to, to, to look in, into disease processes and not feel pressured to produce numbers, numbers, numbers. It's a very safe environment to grow your confidence as a, as a provider. Excellent. So I hope you join us. <laughs> okay, Sandra, thank you so much. And Miriam and Holly and Laura and Deb, thank you all very much for sharing a lot of uh, information. And I, I do agree with those of you who are, are joining us here to learn more about the application process and the program itself. Again, I encourage you go to the website, um, it takes a, a, a few reading uh, times through. There are also those deadlines for when prerequisites, certifications, and all of that are required in order to apply for this next cohort. Applications are open, um, and they will close at the end of January, so you've still got time to take out all these great tips um, into account when you're looking to develop that CV and looking for your references, uh, your DEI statement, and, and, and the rest. Um, we really would like to improve our webinars. So at the end, you will be requested to fill out a survey. Please help us out because we wanna make sure that we're providing all the information um, and, and insight that you're looking for when you join the webinars. Um, also, the email that you receive, it'll have a link to that survey and also a link to view this. And we'll also post this um, recording of, of today's session on our YouTube channel and on our website. So lots of ways to find the information, reach out to the team. They are anxiously um, awaiting being able to help you as you navigate this process. And we just hope that you have a wonderful holiday season coming up. Good luck getting in the application and be well. <laughs>